The likes of Space War had student programmers working together in a capacity unparalleled in earlier computing, proving that unique software for mainframes was becoming as important as the evolving hardware. Of course, unlocking the potential of a computer depended a lot not only on its accessibility, but also its programming language. Higher-level languages of the day, like Fortran and Algol, were not built to be as immediately readable, nor to serve towards tasks outside of scientific calculation. As with Space War, a change in the status quo would come about due to a new audience for the new technology. At New Hampshire's Dartmouth College, math professors Thomas Eugene Kurtz and John George Kemeny were working on bridging that gap. Both of them had the thought, like Jack Dennis at MIT, that computers should be available to undergraduate students, not just electrical engineers who already dedicated their life to them. They decided that the best route to this vision would be to implement a newly formulated system called time-sharing into their local computer. Time-sharing was an emerging concept in which, instead of computers being limited to serial inputs of punched cards or tape, the machine could compute small amounts for multiple users at once. Ergo, access to a computer could be liberated, so long as the tasks each student undertook were a relatively light load. The spread of programs through time-sharing teletypes will become an important facet of our story moving forwards. In order to make effective use of this new model, the professors decided that a new programming language would be created and a new computer acquired. Accessibility was the main priority of Kemeny, who had previously worked with undergraduate student Sidney Marshall to develop a deliberately simplified code called DOPE, D-O-P-E. To build on this playful spirit, Dartmouth would birth a new language, the Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code, BASIC. However stretched an acronym that one was, the purpose of it was bit weird. The syntax of the language was simplified as to provide a far more readable code base, which had at least some similarity to English, and could be used for any number of purposes, not just strict mathematical calculation. Its focus on involving undergraduate students was pervasive, and several such students would assist in its initial operation. In May of 1964, students John McGeechee and Michael Bush managed to get two teletype terminals to access the basic operating system of Dartmouth's GE-225 terminal computer. The language itself had really run several months prior, but this birth of BASIC became a seminal moment for the Dartmouth time-sharing system and the accessibility of programming languages in the future, allowing for creative expansion for years to come. BASIC would remain a standard through the computer revolution as it reached its heights 20 years down the line. Why, though? Programmers of the future would complain about its lack of efficiency, and programming for high production software would hastily move away from anything less than the cutting edge. The ubiquity of BASIC was due to the desire from professors Kurtz and Kamini for it to be used in any way possible by the students at Dartmouth, and then beyond the campus once it spread. Dartmouth owned the rights to BASIC, but let it grow and permutate into a standard programming language across all different types of machines. It became universal. Dartmouth did more than just let BASIC run free. Part of the proposal for the computing system at Dartmouth was to integrate BASIC into all the entry-level math courses at the university, which was now possible with the time-sharing in place. The Dartmouth time-sharing system would become the first commercially successful computer network and began the rapid march to computing's inevitable spread. Once again, these technologically-minded people were helping computers gain traction in society by taking a user-friendly approach. What about those games, though? As noted, BASIC was not the most ideal language for creating games. The user-friendly nature came at the cost of real-time speed, and the language itself was practically designed for computational use, even though it was structured towards having a broader utility. Of course, this never stopped programmers from working wonders in the name of fun. 
Unfortunately, given that these games were saved on punch cards, they're lost to time. This also addresses an important point of conceding that each and every first that we talk about is tentative. There may be many innovations slipping through the cracks, so anything I may say about the early revolutions in video games may not be the absolute truth. Such is the process of history. Higginbotham's game was long thought by the general public to be the first video game, due to its relation with two of the biggest accomplishments in commercial games later on. Noting the gaps in this history allows us to have a complete view of the perceptions of the time. New phenomena are not always initially documented, and thus the earliest basic computer games fall into a category of mostly unknown programs. The earliest suggested game written in BASIC was an American football program by Kemeny, created after Dartmouth Keen beat Princeton College in 1965. BASIC would remain a test ground for interesting experiments on mainframes and beyond, as we'll see. Simulations and learning also opens up the window for our next topic, though this again was still in the old style of computing, wherein programs came from on high. However, this time, the audience was even younger. Sixth graders. There were two strands of technology-based learning in the early 1960s, computer-aided instruction and machine-aided instruction. The latter was all about using simple mechanical or electromechanical devices to assist in teaching, with devices like slideshow displays being used as a learning supplement. Computer-aided instruction envisioned a world where teachers were not just supplemented, but potentially replaced by powerful machines, which were set to change many aspects of life. It was a point that both these technologies were beginning to converge, with select children getting access to terminal time through time-sharing, and educators seeing the potential of teaching machines that a defining simulation would be born. At the center of this were Big Blue, IBM, and the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, BOCUS, for Northern Westchester County in White Sands, New York. Focus, as an organization, had been looking into the potential of creating a game for lower education with a simulation basis. This was not the first attempt for an educational department to tackle such ideas, as a higher education simulator called the Carnegie Tech Management Game had been released in 1957. But the intention with this program was more to instruct rather than simulate, and their Carnegie Tech game had involved a lot of calculation outside of the computer setting. The idea which was chosen for this proposal was received from an elementary school teacher in Yorkshire Heights, New York, named Mabel Addis. Addis had a particular interest in ancient history and, spurred by recent archaeological work around Iran, wanted to reintroduce the history of ancient Mesopotamia, which was absent in many curricula. Addis would work with a representative from BOCUS, Richard Wing, as the program's evangelist. The team also consisted of a high school social studies chair, Walter Goodman, a graduate student, Jimmer Leonard, and project coordinator, Bruce Moncrief from IBM's Advanced Systems Development Division in Yorktown, New York. Moncrief was a very firm believer in the idea that teaching could be systematized in the form of a computer program, specifically through B.F. Skinner's concept of individualized instruction to every student. Moncrief was the one who envisioned the game as an economic strategy game, the best fit for a computer. The game was initially proposed as the Sumerian Play, and Bocus sought $96,000 US dollars from the US Office of Education in December of 1962 to fund this project. They wound up with nearly doubling that funding, and programmer William McKay of IBM worked with Moncrief and Addis to create what was, essentially, a world. The setting would be the city-state of Lagash, circa 3500 BC, ruled by the fictional priest-king family of Luduga. Accompanying players would be a friar of sorts, a guide to the player's actions peppered with prose such as, I beg to report, and the steward will execute the royal commands. These would greatly help in the approachability of the program, 
and mark the first point of computer games as a potential source of developed narrative. While much emphasis was put on the technological and economic accuracy of the program, the intended audience was still 4th to 6th graders. Therefore, the inputs had to be simple, and the history presented in a way that was personal and immediately understood. The game, rechristened the Sumerian Game in 1964, took place over three stages starring each subsequent king of the dynasty, Laduga I, Laduga II, and Laduga III. The first act would see players looking to grow a population by balancing the needs of people with expansion of the land. The one variable at players' disposal was grain, where they could store, plant, and feed it to their people. Feeding would help increase population growth, the real goal, and balancing storage with potential further production would help outpace natural disasters between turns. These could affect population or grain supply, so one had to work towards contingencies. Six turns equaling over three years, culminating in a final victory or failure, the latter of which required a teacher's assistance to restart. In Phase 2, the relationship changed from worrying about people to worrying about the progress of technology. Grain would be traded for goods, which changed the economic model of the program. Act 3 featured contact with nearby civilizations and the development of an army for Lagash's safety. Students would generally be sat down to their own IBM 1050 terminal and be given an introductory slideshow to accompany the instruction. The game as a whole would take several hours for a classroom to complete, and Under the Hood was a program that expanded out to 15,000 lines of Fortran code on an IBM 7090 computer. Continued development on the game proceeded through 1968, at which point funding expired for the experiment. In this time, much was learned about the implementation of such programs in the classroom, but mainly the idea that students liked taking a role in affairs, and it was a very appealing concept. To embody a character in history and to live that out through gameplay was a new breakthrough which accompanied this dynamic, new economic simulation. The Sumerian game set the stage for more intimate simulations and economic strategy, calling on the player to interact with a real narrative for perhaps the first time in the history of computer games. This program was also one of the first to spread throughout mainframes and have a great deal of permutations, of which the famous variant Hammurabi took the spotlight as the originator for quite a few years. The Sumerian game is a cornerstone for nearly all strategy-oriented games that would follow. Elsewhere, the world of real-time display was about to be blown wide open. Previously, this narrative lamented the obscurity of old programs from many of these early computer systems, putting forth the caveat that our understanding is limited by very scant documentary sources available. However, what we'll be talking about next had the fortune of a creator who recognized the importance of his work, and was very meticulous in documenting every step of the way. Rudolf Heinrich Baer, known simply as Ralph, a German immigrant and trained television engineer, was employed at defense contractor Loral Electronics in New York City. He was assigned to a team building a projection television set, which his boss told him must be spectacular. At one point, when messing with the video signals in the TV, Baer found that he could manipulate small bits of light to go across the screen, at will. He asked his boss about implementing this trick as a usable feature in the television, but with only a vague idea of doing something novel with the TV set, the feature went unused. Toying with lights had got Bear thinking about a concept, though, one which would re-emerge 15 years later. Bear subsequently joined Sanders Associates, another defense contractor out of New Hampshire, in 1958, and moved up the management ladder to oversee the electronic design department of around 500 people during his tenure. On August 31, 1966, whilst waiting for a fellow engineer at a bus stop in New York City, Bear began to jot down some notes. 
hardly an unusual thing for Bear, who had already seen several inventions of his go into production. The idea harkened back to the days at Laurel, and would open up new doors for him, and eventually, the entire entertainment world. The device he dreamed up in a five-page document the following day was to be a small box which could play simple games on a television set, utilizing an unused channel. He would initially dub it the Channel Let's Play, and started building the idea entirely in circuitry as a side project. While building the newly formed TV game machine was possible, Bear knew that an essential element of a consumer product was cost. Therefore, he would not be seeking to use integrated circuit technology, which was just starting to become a staple of the solid-state world. Instead, his digital system would largely consist of vacuum tubes and diodes, which were the bedrock of electronics for the past four decades. A technician named Bob Tremblay would help Bayer create the first vacuum tube-based prototype, consisting of a single vertical line which could be moved horizontally across the tube of the television. This was presented to Bear's boss, Herbert Campman, who approved further exploration of this idea with a budget of 2,500 US dollars. The project was conducted in secret inside a locked room at Sanders, and Bear's small team, including brainstorming partner Bob Solomon, initially struggled to find a direction for the system. They initially thought the games would be constructed by splitting the screen in half and players would, based on input outside the television space and directed by a translucent overlay attached to the screen, have to manipulate the line to a particular spot using a joystick or other controller. Input devices were what Bear thought would be the main draw of the game machine, and so he brought in Sanders engineer William Harrison to explore the idea of a light gun which could select answers in a multiple-choice quiz game. Light guns had long been a staple of the coin-operated game space, and a digital implementation seemed like the perfect use of the television. Harrison soon became the sole technician working on the game device, but he was pulled from the project to get involved with a higher-priority job at their employer. Largely directionless, Bear roped in another technician named William Theodore Rush. Rush and he started having brainstorming sessions, and out of this, they came to the idea that players would be more involved in the games if they had a direct object to control on the screen, rather than simply adjusting two color levels. Once Harrison returned to the project in May, they found out they could have both things, and more. The design moved away from vacuum tubes to incorporate transistors, and they were able to include distinct colors rather than simply black and white. Expanding on the earlier ideas, Rush drafted a memo in May which featured 21 game concepts like car racing, roulette, and chase games. These games would feature colored screens and moving objects, but also be supplemented by the translucent graphical overlays from the earlier demo. The first game fully implemented on the TV game number two unit was Pumping Contest, wherein players would rapidly press a button to either raise or diminish the water level in a bucket. Bear and Harrison competed in this game on May 18th, 1967. Who won? They deliberately didn't say. While some of Rush's ideas were a bit too advanced for what they were seeking in terms of their end goal, they did implement seven games for a demonstration in mid-June 1967 to their bosses in order to seek full funding for the project. Bear even created a little audio tape to introduce each game for the demonstration. The team leader felt that they could have a viable product ready by January of 1968 if they were given 17,240 US dollars to see the experiment through to its conclusion. Already, they had left a lot of concepts on the cutting room floor, attempting to narrow down the functionality of this machine to a device which could be sold for under 50 US dollars at retail. The bosses were favorable, if not fully impressed by the games on display. They made a number of suggestions, but approved continued funding of the TV game project. Refocusing on what features had made the best impressions in the meeting, the team almost entirely reevaluated the first functionalities they had implemented. 
they would cut out the color, largely abandon the split screen idea, and focus the device's functionality on the games with the most action. Chief among these were the chase games, where one player would attempt to catch the other, causing their dot to vanish from the screen when touched. They would also keep the gun games, which would run off the same general principle. If the gun detected light, the target would vanish. The idea was to make this box capable of many different types of games through inbuilt functionality, and to this end, they would create circuit cards, which could either enable or disable the individual functions by bridging a gap on the underlying circuit board. There was something missing, though. Another spark was needed to put energy into the TV game project. Bear requested that Rush be brought into the project full-time during July 1967, and the two narrowed in on a concept they had touched on in the May memo. Item 18. Soccer. Hockey. Polo. Rush had envisioned players having an object to kick around the screen, a separate object from the players. The idea had been touched upon technically with an as-yet-implemented torpedo shooting game, but this would be a more complex idea. He started to conceive of what would be the most fun for two people to compete at. On October 18th, 1967, he settled on the idea of the most immediately appealing game he could think of. Ping Pong. Two players would bat a ball between them across a center line to see who missed first. That was it. This concept was a huge breakthrough. The idea required some new hardware to be put in place, giving the TV game control over the direction of the square ball in motion, but the majority of their effort would be funneled into the enhancement of this new conceptual leap. A computer-controlled object which provided some direction to a set of largely player-controlled games. Bear's team would quickly find that trying to enhance the realism of this ball was simply out of scope for the cost they were trying to hit. They wanted to make the ball round and create many different types of graphical effects on the TV, but time and time again, they found it was too expensive to implement in hardware. They also wanted the ball to ricochet at angles off paddles in the screen, yet despite their best efforts, they could never get it working properly. As a substitute to make the ping pong game feasible, Rush added the circuitry for a dial control, which would alter the trajectory of the ball mid-flight, making it swoop around at a player's whim. This was the English control, named after a term in tennis. This would set the basic functionality for the system, now on its fourth design iteration. At this stage, they estimated the electronic materials cost to be about $12 for the system and about $3 for the light gun parts. With a production-ready model approaching feasibility, Bayer felt it was time to try pitching the device to a company. Specifically, he had the idea that cable companies might be interested in it, along with a few other interactive television inventions he had been working on. Cable had a hard time gaining traction in the 1960s, which led many companies to explore avenues to make it more appealing. Bayer conceived of the idea of projecting backgrounds through the television for use on the TV game, like a tennis court, for instance, to tailor the product to the cable company's desires. He managed to begin talks with New York's Teleprompter Corporation at the start of 1968, but while fruitless discussions continued, Herbert Campman ordered a stop to active work on the TV game project at the end of January until more funding could be acquired. Seven months passed until Bayer and Harrison returned to the project. Rush was now no longer needed and with clear minds, they could strip away all extraneous thoughts and possibilities. This would come to market. The largest work left to be done was simply making the hit detection of the various spots bulletproof, including for the light gun. There was very little functionality in this box. It had the barest potential to create the rules for a game with no way to actually track them like a coin-operated game would. What they had was more like a board game with a few automatic components, but most of each game had to be tracked manually. 
As it couldn't detect anything about wins or losses, a reset button would be placed on each controller to allow players to place basic elements of each individual game to their starting positions. These functions, nevertheless, served their purpose. In October of 1968, TV Game 6 would turn into number 7, and as a final touch of aesthetic charm for what would be the showcase prototype, Harrison included some adhesive wood grain paper to the sides of the machine and its new gun control. Therefore, this heap of wires and transistors would be known, now and forever, as the Brown Box. On board, they had seven game types. Board games like Checkers and Maze, which used overlays, chase games, ping pong, hockey, handball, and the shooting games, one with a manually controlled target, the other automatic, and a golf putting game, which used its own unique controller. Their dreams were now packed into a 16 by 12 and a half inch box with toggle switches on the front to change between the games, which they hoped would bring video games to the mass market. From there, they had their earlier concerns of marketing to fall back on, but we'll pick up on this story later. The vague ambition of this crazy machine developed in secret at a military contractor had become something viable. They packed in game variations and functionality far beyond their initial plans, but it was almost unnecessary. The only games that got a strong reaction were the ones with the ball. A desire for action games overtook reproducing board games on the television screen. Not to mention that there was something intensely alluring about the side-to-side -side swinging of ping pong. The motion was fluid and the constraints understood in an immediate way. One did not need to learn nearly as much as something like Space War, which appealed to the scientifically minded. Just bounce. Back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Anyways, we all know that video games have become much more complex later on, due in part to the public's growing understanding of games and computers. That was still a ways off, though, and therefore it was entirely to the realm of the technologically savvy that the audience for the innovations would continue to flourish. With the expansion of computers and time-sharing into education, colleges and high schools the world over would get their first exposure to the simmering phenomenon of video games. In computer labs during late nights, the spirit of the age would drive creativity out of those toying with the potential for their miracle machines. It was a ripe template for breaking barriers, finding fun, and experiments aplenty. Music